supposed to introduce myself, I was told. I will keep it very short. Mia Mezine is my name. I'm a professor of computer science at TU Darmstadt in Germany. Um, doing research with my team there, basically in programming language design and implementation and static program analysis and security. So today, my, my talk is about our work on programming language design. And I will start with a very brief summary of the talk so that you can decide for yourself whether you want to stay to the end or not. Um, so I'm saying that today's applications, and most of them, and what I mean by this, you see a list of some examples of what I consider as typical applications we build today are controlled by the environment rather than controlling the environment um, as traditional ones, which means that they need to react fact, uh, fast to data changes and occurrences of events. And the other um, property of them is that they are mostly about correlating data and events. Correlations are the units, the more interesting units of abstraction and composition rather than individual units, uh, data units. So the question is, how well does existing programming technology, mainstream or not so mainstream, supports these two things, reactive computations, reactive updates, and event data correlations. Let's start with reactive updates. Well, we still um, mostly have this old callback way to handle reactive um, updates to some interesting changes. And basically, I'll tell you that that's not good. Um, and to explain why to make it kind of hands-on um, explanation of what I mean, let's look at a very small piece of code. What does it do? Because it's kind of not very um, straight. Um, it's a mainstream language in which it is implement implemented. We declare three variables, hour, day, and week is kind of an embedded language in Scala. And then we declare three events. So we have a language here that actually supports events first class. Um, kick is somehow triggered, let's say, from hardware, while new day and new week are defined in terms of tick by composing tick with some predicates. Um, and then down here, we attach callbacks by this plus equal operator callbacks implemented as closures in Scala to those events. So far, so good. Let's see what this application, this piece of code does. Well, um, every time a tick is triggered, we'll execute the callback, which will change this variable hour, which may cause the predicate here to get to the field, which will cause new day to be triggered, which will cause the callback associated to new day to be executed, which will change the day variable, which might cause the new week event to be triggered, the associated callback to be executed, and so on and so forth. And I hope that you agree with me that this is way too complicated, way too complex control flow for as simple a thing as basically expressing the time, weeks, days, and hours, which could be expressed in, the, in these three very simple lines, defining hour in terms of ticks and day and week in terms of ticks. If only we had the programming abstractions that allowed us to declare these relationships between the variables and make sure that those values, the, vari the, the variables, are kept up to date. So every time tick changes, hour, day, and week also automatically get up to date. So um, forget about the, the much of the text on this slide. Basically, uh, we all know, I'm not saying uh, much of new things here, that um, callbacks are uh, problematic in the sense that we need a boilerplate code, and we lack abstraction. They are hard programs that work on callbacks are hard to reason about, error prone, hard to, hard to maintain and compose. And basically, there are also um, others, like there, there was this report by Adobe explaining them their application production code. One third of the code is 
about handling events and half of the bugs reported during the life cycle of their products is basically located in this code. Take home message from this slide or these two, three last slides. Um, events and callbacks are a workaround. We can use them, but not a su substitute for real proper support for reactive computations over time changing values. What about data and event correlations? Well, there are tons of, there is tons of technology uh, out there, different silos that do correlation in different ways. So we have complex event processing systems, um, stream processing systems, we have systems that do big data processing, reactive programming, and even concurrent programming languages are somehow about correlating events or have some support. The thing here is that we have a reach or a high feature and semantic variability in Almost all of those you find joins, but they have different semantics. And the question is, it's unclear how these features, how these variable semantics um, compose and interact across domains. So I think this is too much complexity for the poor programmer in the middle that might need a mixture of these different features. And I'm claiming that we are in high need for unifying, generalizing, making those features composable. And to explain what I mean by this, I will use this analogy, which unfortunately is not by me. <laughs> I've borrowed it from uh, Jan Sto Stoika. It basically says, well, we started here with the mobile phones. It's big uh, language, basically. But people realize this mobile communication technology was interesting for a lot of things. And what we saw in the next step were a lot of specialized devices that did one thing with the technology, which eventually finally ended up with our smartphones, which provide a unified platform on top of which we can plug all these different specialized functionalities. So in the rest of my talk, I will basically uh, present the work we are doing in at TU Darmstadt with my team to address these problems. And I will do so in two parts. So in the first part, I will take this, what I call the pragmatic path, or we took the pragmatic path, which basically corresponds to the language we are developing, re Scala, uh, as it is today, or as it's almost today. This is an embedded language in Scala, as the name almost says it. So by pragmatic, I mean we start, start with existing concepts for reactive values and event models and seamlessly combine those and improve them, bring them to this ugly world of distributed, concurrent um, systems that are not uh, reliable. Then in the second part of the talk, which is the shorter part of the talk, I will start looking at a more systematic path towards what I call a unified, unified foundation. Here we reduce the world back to essentials and add built-in support or extensibility, variability, customizability. And this is kind of how we wish Riscala to be in the future. OK, first part, the pragmatic path, signals and events in Riscala. So signals, Riscala features these two concepts of VARs and signals. VARs are variables. They are imperatively, imperatively set inputs, while signals are basically these time-changing values uh, from well known from functional program, reactive programming languages. They are values that change over time. They are composed um, from VARs and other signals. And for the composition, you can use any general purpose computation expressions including combinators, higher level combinators like fold, map, zip, and so on. So basically the code that I showed you, the three lines, is basically code in Riscala. So here we have tick be a variable that is changed in, in an imperative way, while the rest, our day and week, are defined as signals that depend on tick in this case, or they can depend on each other. So I can also define day as depending on our, the number of hours or week, depending on the number of days. The thing is here, every time tick changes, 
the changes are propagated automatically through the flow graph consistently. And this is done by the runtime, so you don't see any the state management in, in the code. What I mean by done by the runtime is the following. Um, let's look at this code. What does it do? It defines a var x and then values that depend on x. Decrement of x then is even, is true when x is even and false otherwise, um, while the value even is defined as this conditional. If um, x is even, it returns, uh, so, sorry, is even returns true when x is uh, even, while this even value is basically either x or the decrement of x depending on the value of is even. And then the last expression just prints the value of even, which is uh, always an even number. Now, this code is basically compiled into a dependency, data dependency graph, where all the variables and computation units are connected by edges based on their data dependencies. Now, let's assume we change x, uh, we set it to 3. This means that this change will be propagated automatically from the x node to all its followers in the graph, and further on to print ln. Um, the thing is that this update is done consistently to ensure what is called in functional reactive programming languages glitch freedom. Um, to illustrate what I mean is, look at this even node. Assume that the change on x arrives along this edge immediately and even propagates, re-evaluates immediately after seeing the change of x and propagates its own change to uh, print ln which in this case would cause that we print three, which is not an even number. The invariant here is only even numbers are printed. Um, that's why it even only evaluates, re-evaluates itself, updates itself when all three or its predecessors that are affected by the change have already evaluated. So it, the guarantee is that each node is evaluated once per update term. And the other thing that this example illustrates is that the, the graph can change dynamically. So x becomes 3, decrement becomes 2, x is not even anymore, so we will uh, now establish the if then else statement, we will establish a dependency between dec and even. Previously, we had the dependency go from x to even. So far, so good. Um, in Rescala, we also have support for events. The, the, simple code, or not so simple, with the complex control flow that we saw was actually written in Rescala. So you can declare events in the interface of some module. You can compose events. You can filter them, basically with the combinators that are available in functional reactive um, languages. The, the thing that I want to emphasize here, that both events and reactives are integrated into O, so they are subject to inheritance and subtype polymorphism. And the other more important thing is that we have made them um, composable. Basically, they are both special cases of a higher level concept called reactives, and they are made composable, interchangeable um, by operators for moving between the two, inter uh, changing them, so even um, an event, we can create a signal out of it by taking the, light, the latest, by applying the latest operator to the event, which basically creates a signal with the latest values exposed by an event. The other way around, given a signal, we cre create an event stream, which basically um, triggers events every time the signal changes. And there are more operators like this one, um, snapshot. Here, there is an event and a signal declared, clicked and positioned, and then I create a new signal last click, um, which depends on both, and basically is kind of um, a subset of the values in the position signal. Only those values are taken uh, when we have an event click triggered. If I didn't have this higher level operators for composing those two things, 
I will have to resort back to using callbacks and get again um, this in interwoven um, um, arrows, control arrows. To summarize, so we have both events and signals in Scala and we made them composable. That's all I've been telling you so far. And they are kind of similar. So we can, given a signal, we can re create an event stream. Given an event stream, we can create a, a signal out of it. But they have different flavors in terms of what they support. So um, with signals, only the change signal is propagated. All dependent computations need to reevaluate from scratch. So if we have, let's say, collections of objects and only one was added or removed, then this is propagated as the collection changed, but not in a fine-grained way individual elements changed. On the other side, but here the, the thing is that the change is propagated automatically and computations reevaluate themselves without us triggering this reevaluation in the application code. On the other side, we have events um, which notify a change, about the change, but also may carry on the delta of the change. So we can use events in a more fine grained way to signal changes. But we have to explicitly encode in the program. Uh, the incremental update, what it means to get some other dependent values up to date. And this could, for example, be used to call for what is missing here, this incremental computation. But remember that what I told you was events. We need them. They exist in the world. But we shouldn't use them as a workaround for time changing values. So in Rescala, we also have support for incremental collections, for example. But I will not go into more details about this. Um, so far, so good. What, what you see with, when you read papers about vector programming, you see claims like improved application design quality, easy to compose, abstractions, declarative style, due to this automatic state management. Um, less error prone improves program comprehension, whereby some authors of some other reactive functional reactive programming uh, system also are not sure about this last claim, kind of assuming that it's not easier for the first reader. So we thought we should evaluate this empirically. Keep in mind, this is in a university academic setting, so there is so much we can do about empirical evaluations, but um, at least we did it. <laughs> we did two empirical studies. The first one was on this research question, do composable events and signal abstractions improve indeed application design? What we did was to take to implement several case studies in two versions, one using only events and callbacks, and the other one using Riscala with its events, signals, um, composable, well, 5,000 lines of code is probably not so much, but that's why it says preliminary. And indeed, we find, found out that um, the design is better because better by the measure of there are less callbacks and we can easier com compose um, abstractions. The other study that we did was a user study. Yeah, users are students. Um, so we took 10 applications, um, implemented in with RP, with Rescala, or with Java and the observer pattern. We split the students in two groups, each group of 20 students. And then they, we give them tasks understanding the, uh, about understanding things in, in the programs. Um, and found out that the RP group, um, the, the answers there were significantly more correct than the OO group. And basically, they were not slower. So in half of the tasks, they were significantly faster. And the other half, half not significantly slower. What I have to say here is that the OO group got OO training from the first semester in the Computer Science 101. They learned about Java and all the years after this, while we introduced them to RP and Riscala only in two lectures. And nevertheless, um, so this kind of shows that the results are not bad, are significant, actually. So armed with this 
encouraging results, um, we thought we should bring this concept to these more complex distributed concurrent and um, um, faulty world out there. And there are, because basically we find callbacks everywhere in those systems, and the hypothesis was that distributed reactives would reduce complexity um, in those systems. But of course, there are key challenges to take there. Uh, and I will briefly talk about these uh, challenges. We need a decentralized propagation control. I will say what I mean. Concurrency control and fault tolerance for those systems. Um, to see what I mean with um, decentralized propagation control, or propagation, uh, update propagation, let, have a, let me summarize the main components of a reactive system of rescala. So what we have is, on one side, we have the user-defined computations. On the other side, on the right-hand side, is the reactive programming runtime. Um, users enter change input values it, from, I mean, in an imperative way. We have the imperative world over here and the reactive world down. Um, they also define signal computations, as we saw. The runtime consists of this dependency graph and the propagation algorithm that kind of causes the nodes in the graph to reevaluate. Uh, while reevaluations go on, these nodes can invoke functionality defined as signals, and signals can have side effects back to the imperative world. And the imperative world can also read, have, we have operations for reading the value of the signals at a certain point. Good. When we go to the distributed world, of course, these things, let's assume we have only two hosts, A and B, then we will have the world up there be split it into two pieces. The signals will live in different hosts, and also the graph will live in different hosts, and there will be these dependency edges that cross host boundaries. So we need the propagation algorithm, nevertheless, although things are distributed, to globally um, take care of this consistency property of the glitch freedom that the updates happen consistently even if in this distributed world. Logically, um, this propagation algorithm is shown as, as a global thing. It needs uh, logically to ensure the property globally. The problem with existing propagation algorithms, there are mainly two of them, two kinds of. One is topological sorting. So as I said, we need to ensure that each node only re-evaluates when it inputs have evaluated. So basically, we can have a topological sort of the graph, and then we have this priority queue that controls when each node can um, re-evaluate. The thing is here, every node that is affected by some update needs to talk to the priority queue to see whether it can re-evaluate or not. And this is obviously not good in a distributed setting. The other version is the global flooding of N. N um, basically, whether some input changed or not, so the, the green ones change, N sends change or no change signals. So the nodes that didn't change just say, I didn't change to the rest. And this is propagated through all the graph, flooding, flooding. And of course, this doesn't scale in a distributed setting, again, because there is so many um, messages that are sent around for nothing. These, all these yellow parts didn't change, do not need to be affected by the update. Nevertheless, they are affected, and there are messages going through them. Um, Rescala um, adopted a decentralized propagation. I will not go into the details if, because I want to have time for questions, So, but I have slides to explain some more details if you want afterwards. But basically, the idea is that each node in the graph is enabled to autonomously decide whether and when to reevaluate. It only needs to know about the neighbors. And the propagation algorithm is adjusted to propagate knowledge about what changed, which nodes were changed. With these two pieces of knowledge, the neighbors and the, the kind of the set of input nodes 
that are that are in the scope that can uh, that from which I can reach a certain node um, are enough for deciding autonomously. Okay, so we formalized this algorithm, proved it correct in terms of glitch freedom, termination, completeness. We compared it, its complexity with the two other algorithms and also empirically showed that indeed it's better in terms of completion time and in terms of the number of messages exchanged. Next, concurrent updates. Um, here are two updates kind of visualized as yellow and green, and they run concurrently in a multi-threaded environment. And even if each of them might be consistent, when they run concurrently, we get inconsistencies due to uh, data races at shared nodes. May uh, happen. So we want to isolate them to keep this property even in a, a multi-threaded environment. And what we do is basically we want to ensure serializability of these update terms, which in terms of data management system tends to see as being transactions. Um, the data affected by transactions are the signals and events, and then there are some operations that we need to kind of um, serialize. Um, the good thing, and we want to do this uh, to avoid aborts and to avoid rollbacks. So we want concurrency control hidden in the runtime so that the application remains declarative and composable and doesn't have to care about the concurrency control. And the good news is we were able to do so thanks to um, specific features of the reactive paradigm. The thing that the reactive runtime manages the control flow of the application gives the runtime enough knowledge about the transaction behavior. It would think of propagation algorithm as being the transaction profile. That's why even when changes happen that otherwise would cause the transactions to abort, our propagation algorithm, then the integrated serializability part in it, can change things such that the world is brought again in a consistent state. OK, um, since I was signaled that, oh, OK, yeah. The next thing we are doing now um, is looking at fault tolerance because distributed systems, as I'm not saying anything new here, are not reliable. Topology can change, clients joining and leaving, messages can go, get lost, and clients or nodes can crash and we, lo we lose state. So very briefly, kind of high level, what are the aspects that we are looking at in this space? First, this is also related to the distributed uh, part. So we are looking at defining con constructs primitives to talk about remote nodes in a heterogeneous multi-tier um, application. So we are working towards a tierless reactive programming to make Riscala a tierless reactive programming language um, to have things like place this uh, signal on this node and do so in a type safe way without being able to give you much detail. The other thing is how to do the placement automated, question mark. We don't know whether this, so far it's a manual. But the thing is that the reactive um, paradigm, again, gives us some leeway. Because if I can ensure that side effects happen only at inputs and outputs, and the middle part of the graph is side effect free, then I have a lot of freedom to move those nodes as I wish between the hosts to minimize, for example, network hops or to distribute load or to replicate computation. So part of this graph is now replicated on this, on this host. One thing we are doing is to um, do fault handling. Existing reactive languages do not support fault handling at the programming uh, API level. Um, so we can handle fault in the graph itself, um, signals and events have now in their API methods to recover from exceptions, or we let them go to the output nodes and be observed, either handled at the observer nodes or um, thrown to the color. Uh, and we are basically integrated exceptions in a very natural way in the propagation algorithm. They propagate the same way as values propagate through the graph, and this can be also used for propagating 
no values, um, delayed values, and so on and so forth. The last piece is kind of looking at snapshots and recovery, and the only message to take home here, I mean, this client may crash, and we want to store uh, the state and restore it. Um, when the when we move, for example, the computation somewhere else, or the client comes, or the, the host comes back, the message to take home here is again, due to knowledge about the way computations flow through this graph, we can manage to uh, snapshot a minimum amount of data. So to conclude those, this part, the home take home message so far is, you can see it at what I talked so far from two perspectives. One perspective is, Rescala bring those declarative concepts of, um, of FRP, functional reactive programming, signals and events to the imperative concurrent distributed world. The other way to look at what I talked about is if you model your computations in a reactive way, for example, with a reactive language as Rescala, this gives you composability for free even in a distributed multi-threaded environment. Second part of the talk, um, principal path towards what I call the unified unify foundations. You remember this picture that I showed and I said we need to unify things. If we look at reactive programming, because this is what I'm talking about so far, and consider correlations there, basically we have very good support for doing things like filtering events in an event stream um, grouping them by some um, criteria, zipping two streams together, counting and the like. But this world fails short in doing other kinds of correlations, things like timing or partial order patterns, negation or cross-referencing. And there is another domain that excels at this kind of patterns. This is the complex event processing world. Um, where you can express things like report the five most profitable Uber routes in New York City within the last 24 hours. Um, it's not easy to express the same functionality in RP. The, the problem here is that semantics is not as well defined and the challenge is the semantic variability. What I mean by this is illustrated by, by this colorful um, pictures here. So assume we have this correlation pattern, and these are the observations. This is the event stream that we see. And now we need to correlate according to this pattern. And the matches are shown here. This is the list of all pairs that match this pattern. Now, the thing is, which one do I select? I could select first received according to this uh, criteria, and then the result would be these two matches. Or I can take the most recent, and then this would be the result. Both are maybe valid decision in particular contexts. The thing is that the CP uh, engines force me to into a fixed semantics for the correlation. And that's why we started working on this um, core language. It's really a core language. It's more like a formal language right now. It's called Coral. And here we express uh, declarative language embedded event correlations as comprehensions. What a surprise. Um, here is how it looks like. I mean, don't take this syntax for, for the given. We are changing it. This is just to illustrate. What do we have here? We have a correlates uh, um, expression. And basically, we correlate events coming from these three streams, shop uh, baskets, payments, and authorizations to derive a stream of purchase events, composed events. Uh, the upper part defines three binders, B, M, and A, uh, which binds events from these three streams. The middle part defines constraints on the bound events. The first one says that, causally, basket events should come before payment events. We need authentication to happen five minutes after the payment occurred. And there is a um, identity constraint here um, 
that says that they all have to have the same transaction ID. And if these constraints are fulfilled, then we produce, we put the events that match the constraints into a data type and yield it as a new event. What is interesting about uh, to note here is the two things. First of all, these constraints, they are just, in this case, Scala expressions. So they are expressions in the language, nothing domain specific or external to the language. The more interesting thing is that um, this might look like um, direct style pool based uh, semantics, which is it, it is not. It's basically oh, everything is push based. Events arrive whenever they want. They arrive in, uh, in an asynchronous way. That means that this comprehension is not kind of the um, monadic comprehension style of functional programming languages. This you can see as a parallel lambda abstraction and enary with n inputs that come in parallel. They can be inter, uh, interwoven, interleaved with each other. And we progress the evaluation at any time. When one of the inputs comes in, we can decide earlier to cancel the selections because one of the constraints, for example, is violated. Now, what about this variability, the semantic variability that I talked about? Let's illustrate this with an example. Assume we have these two event streams, A and A and B, that produce events over time. Now, the simplest way to correlate them is to say, select one from A and one from B and produce the pairing of them, which is basically the set of all these associations. Everybody, every event is uh, paired with every other is the Cartesian product, which might not be the best for all cases. So how do we? Can we refine this correlation semantics? In this second example, what I do is put this correlate expression, which can be first class object, within two so-called effect handlers. Those are first class context objects that hook into the semantics, into the correlation um, um, semantics computations as they unfold and change them, modify them. In this case, the most recent effect handlers make sure that only the most recent event pairs are paired together. And this is done as the correlation unfolds. That means it's not that we produce all and then um, select those that fulfill, but during the control flow of the correlation, the semantics is changed. And basically, if you want, this is the semantics of Riscala. Re this is what, what Riscala, how Riscala correlates input reactives or events. But we can have more. Like here, I put the, all of it into another effect handler, which basically, once um, an A event is paired, it's, it's gone. It's not paired with other events. Um, at the more abstract level, what we get is basically a simple streamlight streamlined and extensible runtime. Special new correlation semantics are libraries. The language is scalable. And one can uh, choose between defining some basic correlation semantics as libraries that come with the language. But the correlation semantics users can also define new effect handlers to uh, customize the correlation semantics for their particular needs. Um, the key ingredients, the building blocks of the language are a core for functional language, on top of which we have added um, an imperative, uh, imperative part for supporting asynchrony and timing, and parallel binding, which comes with asynchrony. And then on top of this, there are these algebraic effect handlers, um, which go back to Plotkin. They are kind of a flavor of delimited continuations that interpret side effecting commands locally. We can think of them as exceptions, try-catch blocks, but they resume back uh, to the control flow of the trigger. With this, I want to conclude my talk um, with some pictures of people involved in the development of Riscala and Coral, and uh, beyond those that are shown here in pictures, there are quite a number of students, master students, that have been involved in the work so far. Thank you, and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you. Uh, yeah.
<laughs> okay, uh, why is Scala is a language, not a library? Which of the feature requires you to actually change the language and can be expressed in Scala? We don't change the language, Scala is basically a library. Uh, okay. Uh, there is no changes to the compiler. Okay. It's an embedded language. We use Scala features that allow one to embed the language as a library but look pretty much integrated into the Scala itself. Everything is a library. Okay, so it's a library with the own DSL, right? Right. Okay. I mean, and <laughs> Cora is <laughs> okay, but you can. Okay, okay. Uh, what's the uh, then uh, next uh, question? What is the core difference between uh, the uh, Eric Scala uh, and the Eric Scala? Well, I think the, the, the core difference is in the way, I think ReactiveX doesn't support reactive values natively. It's basically event correlation with the semantics I showed in the RP uh, domain. Um, but then when it comes to model the reaction to those events and event correlations, you basically go back to observers, I would say. While here, the values propagate very smoothly through dependent computations in a very declarative way. So Rx doesn't have this support. And then it, when it comes to the distribution and concurrency, I think Riscala excels compared to ReactiveX. And, and I emphasize that we see our main contribution in taking those concepts and bringing them to the, in the pragmatic path, bringing them to the distributed um, concurrent world. But maybe we can take that other question over there. <laughs> and then we can take offline the, the rest. Hi. Um, you started this project as a research project on its own, or there was a, a, a problem you wanted to solve uh, using Reactive? <laughs> um, let me go back to the. So this project is basically funded by this. this Icon on the left hand side by the European Research Council with an ERC advance grant. And when I sat down to write this project proposal, I thought, what is the problem I want to solve? And basically, um, this was the problem statement. Um, I thought about applications that are built today, what characterizes them, and then looked at the technology we have and identified the problems that I showed in the first five minutes. This was my project proposal, it got funded, and we have been working since then on this project. Okay, so tell me again.